to speak to us as we get ready to receive the blessing. Ephesians chapter 5, we are continuing in our series of uh, the church. Jesus said, as our theme this year, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. We've been looking at uh, the Lord's involvement in the church, why he loved the church, and what is he doing for the church. And today we're going to continue in our series from Ephesians chapter 5 and looking in that parallel between, in that chapter where it talks about the relationship of a husband with the wife and is as a picture of Jesus and his relationship with the church. So if you're able to stand in honor of reading God's word, let's do so. Ephesians chapter 5, as we get ready. Uh, Mrs. Jones was uh, scuffling through her purse uh, during the offering time. And uh, as she was uh, looking for her offering money, uh, a TV remote fell out of her bag into the aisle. And uh, one of the ushers, uh, looking quite, uh, you know, uh, questionable about what actually took place, went over, picked up the remote and said to Mrs. Jones, do you carry a TV remote with you everywhere you go? She says, no, not particularly, but this Sunday, my husband refused to come to church with me. And I thought, what is the most evil thing I can do legally to him so that he will remember to come to church next week? And so uh, we ought to always encourage one another, provoke one another unto good things, provoke each other that we would come and meet in the Lord's house and, and uh, that we would uh, worship the Lord together. I think it's a wonderful thing as we come together. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. Let's read from verse number, number 20 as we got up on our screen. Uh, Giving thanks always... And for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church." For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today uh, for your word and this portion of scripture. Help us, Lord, now. Uh, may we not be distracted. May the evil one not rob us of uh, God's word, the good seed of God's word. May it be sown in our hearts. And may it bear much fruit in our life. We love you and we thank you. Help us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I just want to say a couple of words before we start uh, the message this morning. May I encourage you that you get to church a little bit early. Uh, we have coffee and a bit of time of fellowship uh, starting from 10 a.m. So you can kind of arrive at church from 10 a.m. And uh, we want to be here to uh, fellowship with one another, encourage one another, and then be ready to start church on time. Unfortunately, what's happening is we've got into this culture where we know church starts at 10.45, uh, we arrive just at 10.45. And uh, then we're scrambling, trying to find a parking spot, or we're scrambling, trying to get the kids signed in into our children's ministry. And by the time we do all of that, we're not coming into the auditorium till about 11 a.m. And so we've missed 15 minutes of worship. Some people think, well, you know, it's only the singing. As long as I'm there for the preaching, it's okay. Now, you're missing a big part. The Lord wants you to sing praises to his name. It's unfortunate that we uh, think that our worship uh, service is just secondary. No, we come together to worship the Lord. And so, please, make an effort, if you can, let me encourage you, make an effort to be here before time. You know, some of you, I, I, I guess none of you will go to work 15 to 20 minutes late every day. I guarantee you that if you had a, if you, your kids at school, you get them there before time. 
I even guarantee that if you had a doctor's appointment or any appointment with your accountant or lawyer or whoever it might be, you make sure that you're there early. And if you didn't know about the parking, you investigated the parking to make sure how long is it going to take me to get there, park my car so I can be at the appointment on time. Why is it then when it comes to the Lord's house, we just uh, happy-go-lucky. We get there whenever we want to. No, let's be encouraged. Let's encourage one another. Let's make an effort. Let's make an effort that we say, no, this is the Lord's day. This is the Lord's house. And they start at 10.45. I want to be there at 10.15. At 10.15 is when we're going to start. And, and we're going to be there to fellowship and check my kids in, get things, everything ready, and come and sit in this auditorium. Now, we put these new screens here uh, at the front so that people, you know, people said, well, Pastor, we can't sit too close, and we've got to look at the screen like that. We get whiplash, or our next, you know, are broken by the time the song service is over. So we've installed these screens so that you can come closer, and you can see the words, and you can sing. Now, you know, they say, you've got to get early to a Baptist church to get the back row. Uh, you know, we need to learn to start moving a little bit forward, sit a little bit closer. Let me tell you, when you sit closer to the front, you're not being distracted by people who are in front of you. You know, people sit and they, you know, move their head, they, they, you know, they're moving around in their chair. And what ends up happening is you get distracted from the Word of God because you're trying to follow what everybody else is doing that is sitting in front of you. So I encourage you. The front row seats should be prime seats. And that the back rows should only be for, for parents who've got children or little kids. that If they're in distress, they can walk out. And also the back of the church is for visitors. You know, visitors don't like to walk in and sit right at the front. Uh, they like to just slip in and sit at the back. But if the church family is occupying the whole back row, where will our visitors sit? So I want to encourage you that as we learn how to uh, uh, behave ourselves in the Lord's house, Let's do that. Let's be welcoming. Let's be encouraging. Let's sit towards the front. Let's come early. It will, become a, it will be a great blessing. And I know this, you know, if we don't start somewhere, this culture will continue to grow. And some of us will probably end up being in church at the closing prayer. By the time the pastor says, let's bow our heads in prayer, that's when we rock up to church. So let's not do that. Let's be in good spirit and let's encourage one another to be here early, fellowship a little bit, have a coffee or tea, whatever you like, and there's some biscuits and cookies, etc. Let's fellowship a little bit and let's come together. When that bell rings, we all want to make our way in here. The bell is not there to tell you, okay, you just keep, go keep going with your conversation. The bell's not there that you say, well, it doesn't matter what Brother Alex is trying to get us into the auditorium to start. Uh, we'll just continue fellowshipping. And some people are still hanging around and loitering all over the building. Uh, if you're hearing my voice and you're out in the building right now, unless you've got little kids, you should be in the foyer area there. And please maintain silence. Uh, that's not time for you to fellowship and talk in the mother's area. In the mother's area is for you to watch it online so you're not distracted. So please let's maintain that. that. And if you're outside the auditorium uh, and you're out in the car park, uh, I ask you, why did you come to church? If you don't want to sit in the auditorium, you don't want to be under God's, uh, God's word, why are you loitering around? So let's make every effort that we uh, encourage one another. If you see somebody who's loitering, encourage them to come into the auditorium and let's sit together under the preaching of God's word. And all God's people said? Amen. No, no, I didn't hear that. And all God's people said? Amen. All right, wonderful. All right, Ephesians chapter 5 is our text this morning. And uh, we've looked that uh, in our series that Jesus loved the church and he gave himself for it. He died for you. Jesus came to this earth and he died on the cross for your sin, that he would give you eternal life. When you believe on Jesus Christ by faith, uh, that you believe that he is God incarnate and that he's the only one who can forgive your sin, he's the only one who can take you to heaven. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God, that you, become, you enter into God's family, and then the Lord had purposed that every Christian should meet together locally as a local assembly, a called out assembly, that we come together and we worship and we sit under the preaching of God's word. That's how we encourage one another. So church is important. Church is important not because it is a place that men, uh, you know, who said, uh, you know, this is good for religion. No. Uh, church is important because Jesus instituted it. Jesus said, I will build my church. 
And this was not a pope who thought it was a good idea. This was not a pastor who thought it was a good idea. This was Jesus himself who said, I will build my church. And if today you find yourself belonging to this local assembly or attending in this local assembly, you are obeying what Jesus has called for every believer to do. And so as we come together, we come remembering that Jesus ordained and instituted the church, and we are privileged, we are privileged to be part of it. We are privileged to have the opportunity to come and worship. There are many Christians around the world today that meet in fear, that meet uh, wondering whether they're going to be captured that day. And I know of some uh, who I have uh, come to know out of Laos and some of those communist countries where pastors and preachers have actually gone to prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we are in this country where we have freedom of religion, freedom to, be, to come together and, and uh, proclaim the word of God and, and not have any fear that somebody's going to just come in here and capture us and take us to prison. It is a privilege. It is a privilege. Count it a privilege that you have the opportunity to be in God's house to worship with the saints. Jesus loved the church. And he gave himself for it. What a great price. What a great price he gave for you and for me. And what an honor it is to be a child of God, to worship the Lord together. It is a privilege. Not only did the Lord love the church and give, gave himself to it, as we said in past weeks, but last week we spoke about that he sanctifies and he cleanses the church. We, we, we looked last week that through the preaching of the word of God, uh, that saints are edified and we are cleansed from sin and cleansed from our ways which are not right, which are not godly. And the Lord wants to do that work. God wants to do that work in your life. And he wants to present himself a glorious church, uh, the bride of Christ, to be glorious, uh, to be beautiful, to be without spot and wrinkle, we said last week. And so when we come, when we come with this purpose, we want the Lord to speak to us. Uh, we want the Lord to challenge us. We want the Lord to change and transform our life, change our thinking, change our heart's desires, that we would be more like Jesus. And that's the reason why we come to church. We want God to do that work in cleansing us. And this morning, I want us to focus on our last part, and that is that the Lord sustains his church. And we looked at it in past week that the Lord sacrificed his life for the church. Last week we looked at that Jesus sanctifies the church. And today I want us to look at Jesus, or the Lord, sustains his church. Uh, the survival and success of the church is all about its dependency upon Jesus Christ. It's all about it's the church being dependent upon Jesus Christ. It's not about whether we have religious formalism. It's not because we can sing certain songs. It's not because we read a certain version of the scriptures. It's not because we stand and we sit or we give. No, it's because Jesus is the one who sustains his people. He sustains the church. I want us to look in our passage this morning as, uh, into three things. I want us to see that the, the Lord or the Word of God gives us a picture of this relationship between Jesus and the church uh, in correlation to how a husband and wife uh, relate to one another. The Bible says uh, here that, uh, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Uh, what a great statement. Uh, that we would love our wives, we love our homes, uh, just like how we love ourselves. And I haven't met a man yet who doesn't love himself. I haven't met a man who, you know, despises what he looks like and, and, uh, and you know, wants to look really terrible and, and uh, doesn't want to eat food, doesn't want to exercise, doesn't want to look, uh, doesn't want to sleep, doesn't want to nurture his body. I haven't met a man that is like that who is in full uh, control of his mental faculty, right? And there are people who've got mental uh, issues, which we understand, but anyone who is reasonable and had still good reason would always take time to look after himself. And so here the Bible says that a man ought to love his wife just like how he loves himself. Let me tell you this. When you're hungry, you're going to go scour through the cupboard and through the fridge and you're going to graze on anything that you'll find. All right? Yeah, you, you're going you're to try to satisfy that hunger. You're going to try uh, to fulfill uh, that need in you. If you're tired... Uh, you, you will say, listen, excuse me, I'm just going to go to bed early tonight. I, I really need my rest. Uh, or some of you might even sleep right through my message this morning because you had a late night last night. 
But whatever it is, whatever it is, we always look to satisfy the needs, don't we? Our own personal needs. And here the Lord is telling the man, the husband, that you must take care of the needs of your wife just like how you take care of your own personal needs. And that the picture there is just like how Jesus takes care of his church. So our thoughts today is around how does Jesus take care of his church? How does Jesus take care of of his church. Well, firstly, I want you to see that Jesus takes care of his church because it's motivated out of love for, uh, for, the, for the church. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Uh, uh, as a man loves his body, Christ also loves the church. Uh, he loves her and uh, as his own body. But I want you to see that as the, ch- the church is derived from Christ, just like how Eve was derived from Adam. Remember the story, uh, God looked upon Adam and said it was no good for man to be alone, but he created for him a help me. And so uh, Adam will fall asleep and uh, God will uh, surgically remove a rib and out of that rib he makes a woman for him. And uh, so she's derived from man and and, uh, and he was to care for her and to love her and uh, nurture her and look after her. And so the same thing with, with the church. The church did not come into existence of itself. Uh, You were not saved uh, by yourself. Uh, We came from Christ. How? Uh, Jesus died for you and for me, and and because of his regenerating power to make us alive unto God when we come to him by faith, that we now come into existence as a church because of what he did. And so the church is a a, a derivative from the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, Out of his own side, when we see uh, there on the cross, uh, 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 blood and water flowed out of his side. And and we see that that's what brought us into redemption, brought us to be purchased by him. His blood was paid for your sin and my sin. And, And that water represents the word of God that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and keeps us right with him. Now we need... We need to see that our position in Christ, as a, as a church, we, we came because of Jesus. Today, you come into church because of Jesus. When we're here, we worship Jesus. And this is not about elevating a man. It's not about elevating a denomination. It's not about being Baptist. No, this is about Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for what Jesus has done for us. Because through him, we can only have forgiveness of sin. Without him, there is no forgiveness of sin. It's not because you're a good person. It's not because you were religious. It's not because you belong to a denomination. You're going to heaven. No, because Jesus died for you. You need to understand that the only way you can go to heaven is through the person of Jesus Christ. And because we put our faith in him, he has brought us together into this place, which we call a church meeting. I mentioned this last week, the the reason we have problems and uh, misunderstanding about church is because we think church is the building. I'm going to church. So we're we're referencing the building. No, the building is not the church. I think what we need to do is change our conversation and the way we say things. Uh, Rather than saying, I'm going to the church, we should be saying, I'm going to a church meeting. Uh, What does that mean? That group of believers are meeting together. That's what a church meeting is. And I think if we begin to reference things in the right way, we will begin to understand church is not about coming to a building. Church is about us as a group of believers who have bonded and have a covenant with one another that we will worship the Lord and exalt his name and keep the doctrine straight and we're going to meet together to encourage one another. That is a church meeting. This morning we are in a church meeting. We're We're not doing just church. We are at a church meeting. And so the group of believers together come to worship the Lord. So the Lord motivated out of love to us, out of love to us. And he has drawn us, he has saved us, and he has put us together. So as we meet this morning, we must give thanks to the Lord who has put this together. The Lord has put this together. The Lord has allowed you to be here. That's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Not only is the church a derivative of Jesus, but it's also an extension of Jesus. Just like how Eve was an extension of Adam, and just like how your wife is an extension of you, whether it be at home or wherever she may be, because the two of you are one, she's an extension of you. 
uh, you know, my wife can go and make a choice to, to, to do something that affects our family, and uh, she does that because she's an extension of me. And that uh, she can negotiate, she can do things, she's an extension of me. Uh, she represents our home. And uh, so when we think about the church, the church is an extension of Jesus Christ. How is that? Well, the world needs to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. The world needs to see a church that is true to form and true to its love to Jesus. The church is not a place where we come and just do our religious obligations. The church is not a place where you just say, well, I've done what God wants me to do. Tick, and now I can go and live my life the way I want to live it. No, the church is at work 24-7, seven, seven days a week. What do I mean by that? The church in its power is not because we meet, but because we go live our lives in our, de- in our separate communities and are impacting the world around us. You are an extension of Jesus Christ. You are a representative of Jesus And so the way you live, the way you talk, the things that you do, the way you conduct yourself at work, uh, whether you're honest or not honest, you are a reflection of Christ. And so the church is an extension of Jesus. I think we need to know that. Sometimes we think, well, no, I've done my part. I've gone to the church building. I've sung the songs. I've put my money in the offering. And uh, I've listened to that man speak, and uh, he, put me, he puts me to sleep. Uh, but, but I've done my part, God. I've done what you wanted me to do. Now I'm going to get on with my life. No, the church is an extension of Christ. And motivated by love, as he loved us, we love him. We love him because he first loved us. And out of love, we are motivated to be the right extension of Jesus Christ. Just like how the husband-wife relationship is, and the wife is an extension of the husband, so is the church an extension of Jesus Christ in this world. I think it's important that we understand that. Because uh, when I am on Monday through to Friday uh, going to work and living my life uh, with unsaved people, I must always remember this very truth that I am an extension of Christ here on earth. I'm his representative. I must show Christ who's the hope of glory in me. So what hope does the world have if you cannot live and you cannot show yourself and conduct your life and conduct your affairs as an example of who Christ is? What hope is there? Why should they? Why should they come and be Christians when you live just like them, when you're dishonest like them? when you cuss and swear and do evil things just like them? Uh, Why do they need your God if there's no transformational change about you and about your connection with Jesus Christ? See, the church has great privilege and great power. Privilege that it came from Christ. Great power and privilege that we are to hold up the light in this world. And it's all motivated by love. Secondly, I want you to see that the Lord himself uh, takes care of the church and in evidence through what he does. Uh, look what he says. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord, uh, he loves the church, and he nourishes and he cherishes well, what do these words mean? Well, to nourish someone is, a, is the idea of providing nutrients or providing food for growth and for development and maturing. And so the Lord wants to mature his, his church. He wants to mature his people. Uh, 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 Jesus Christ is the one who's the head of the church, and uh, he's the one who will supply this nourishment to the church. It's not because of our uh, religious ordinances, uh, religious ordinances and is not what matures, matures us to be the people of God or to be the church of God. Open up with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read something. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, on respect of a holy day, or of the new moons, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding to those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. 
what, what, what Paul is saying here is that don't be, don't be deceived, don't, don't be forced or pressured by keeping feast days, by, by doing a, a different ordinances, a, a, by false humility, by false worship, thinking that you are doing this and that's going to nourish you and it's going to develop you as a Christian. Yeah, you know what they said, that verse 19, and not holding the head. Uh, verse 19 is not holding the head, is reference to the connection to Jesus Christ, from which all the body uh, by joints and, and bands, having nourishment, ministered, and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, that is, if you count yourself dead, we're not going to follow the things that the world sets, the way the world does things, the way the world practices religion. Uh, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Paul is trying to say here is that it's not through our ordinances and it's not through our uh, uh, religious uh, performances uh, that matures us as a church. No, it is supplied by the head, which is Jesus Christ, and he is the one who nourishes, nourishes and supplies the need to the body. Verse 23 uh, can be stated this way, although these have reputation for wisdom by, by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. And the Word of God is telling us that all these rudiments of the world are not going to solve sin problem, and they're not going to solve the transformational change that you and I need to become more like Christ. Well, if it's not that, then what is it? Well, the Lord wants to nourish you and bring you into maturity. How does the Lord do that? How does the Lord bring us into maturity? How does he nourish us? Nourishes us? How does he make us grow? Well, the Bible tells us that he, he has given us his Holy Spirit. I want you to know the Lord has purpose in growing you. Uh, Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, uh, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it. You know that word there, to, will perform it? It means that he will mature you. He will work on you. You are working progress in God's timeline until he returns or until we go home. Uh, he will continue to perform this perfection in your life until the time we meet with the Lord. God has, Jesus has a purpose in nurturing his, his church and to growing him. Well, how does he do it? Well, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Uh, have a look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the Bible says to us, but we all with open face beholding as in the glass, so we're looking through it, into, through a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into that same I image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, this change of maturity in your life as a Christian uh, many Christians spend, the rest, uh, spend all their life being carnal, being little children. You ever seen a little kid when you take something off him? What does he do? He chucks a tantrum. He throws himself on the ground or, or starts to scream and think until you give him what he wants. Uh, many Christians are in that fashion. Uh, they don't like the rules. Oh, I don't like how you change things here, Pastor. Oh, I don't like how the church is doing this. And, and whenever you change things on them, there's always an outcry. Well, what? Listen, isn't it time that we've matured? Isn't it time that we've grown up in the Lord? Isn't it time that when hard things come our way, we don't begin to whine and complain and throw ourselves on the ground and chuck a pity party? Isn't it time that we mature and say, Lord, you, we know you have purpose for us? Uh, we know, Lord, that through this difficult time, you have ne never left us, you'll not leave us or forsake us. Isn't it time that we mature ourselves? And the Bible says that in the book of Hebrews, when it was time for you to become teachers, you needed someone to teach you again. Uh, the foundations and the basic things uh, of Christ and, and the Word of God. Listen, it's time that we mature. 
It's time that we take a, a note and say, Lord, I need to grow. I need to grow in you. I need to grow in the Word of God. And Lord, I know that it is the Holy Spirit that works in my life to transform me and to change me. That I, what I used to be in the world, the way I used to act, the things I used to do, the things, the places I used to go, the way I used to think and, and the way I used to live life, Lord, I want that to change and be transformed into the image of your Son. How many people would say, I would love my life? life to be as good as the life that Jesus demonstrated here on earth. I hope that is your goal in life. I hope that that is the thing that you're seeking after. Lord, make me more like you. Uh, Lord, uh, let, me, let me erase uh, the life of the past and uh, give me a life that is new, that is more like you. you know, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, God the Lord sent His Spirit to us uh, if you're a believer this morning, if you've accepted Christ Jesus, the thing that, distincts you, that makes a distinction for, uh, uh, for between you and the world and the unsaved is that you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. You have the Holy Spirit of God. Why do you have the Holy Spirit? That he becomes that agent of change in your life. He begins that work to transform your life from what it was to what Jesus designed and intended for your life to be. And it's up to you whether you yield to that Spirit or you do things your own way. Uh, Satan wants to take the world and you want to bring, wants to bring worldliness into your life that he makes you more like him. And God has given you his Holy Spirit to transform your life to become more like Christ. God wants to nourish the church and he gave the church his Holy Spirit to transform us. Not only did he, did he give us the Holy Spirit, but he gave us his word. At 2 Timothy 3.16, we all know this, know this verse, uh, but turn with me because we've got some people here uh, who are new. If you've got your Bible, open up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, not perfect, that is he doesn't do anything wrong or he's sinless, but he is matured. Truly furnished unto all good works. Prepared and ready for all good works. The Lord has given us his word, which is profitable for us. It's profitable for doctrine, that which is truth and that which is right. It's profitable for reproof, to show us that which is wrong, that which is incorrect. It's profitable for correction, so if there's anything wrong, we can get it right. And it's a profitable for instruction and in righteousness that we'll know to continue doing the right things. Why? God has given us his word that he will perfect the saints, perfect you and me, mature us to know God's ways, to know how God wants us to act, and so we can perform the good works that he wants us to live by. Not only he's given us his word, but he's also given us uh, pastors and preachers, uh, the men of God in our midst. If you go with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, go back to where we were in Ephesians in chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 11, the Bible says, And he, being Christ, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, why? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a matured man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the purpose, that we become more like Christ, and that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, you know, you can confuse a kid, can't you? Uh, you can tell him a story and he will believe it and he'll go one direction. Uh, what he wants is, the, is not to stay as children, being gullible with every voice that we hear in this world. No, he wants to mature you, mature us as a church, that we know the word of truth and we know his ways. And we will no longer be tossed to and fro with every sound of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And that's what is it happening in the world. Yeah, there are many voices there. Many have different opinions. Many people tell you, oh, this is the right way. But really, if we listen to the Word of God, if we study the Word of God, uh, we know that God wants to mature us to understand right from wrong and to know what is His clear path. And so the Lord has given us the man of God in our midst that He would help us 
understand the Word of God and understand the will of God and understand what God has for us, that we will not be deceived and be shaken in our minds and be taken in every slight of doctrine. God wants to mature. Jesus wants to mature you, wants to mature his church. And he's given the church the Holy Spirit. He's given the church the Word of God. And he's given the church the, the man of God. The Bible also tells us that Jesus also cherishes, he cherishes the church. Just like a man nourishes and cherishes his own body, so Jesus cherishes also the church. And the word here to cherish is the idea of providing clothing to keep warm. So to nourish is to give food, to cherish is to give that clothing or protection that is necessary. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. The Lord cherishes his church. And he's cherished you by giving you a robe of righteousness. We're glad that we're clothed by the righteousness of Christ. He became sin, that we may have the righteousness of God in him. And he died for you. He became sin on that cross so that you could have righteousness, so that you could be clothed with righteousness. And the Lord cherishes the church, and he has clothed it with his garment of righteousness. Jesus cares for the church. Jesus cares for you. Uh, understand that. Never, never think, why has God left me? Why, why is God far from me? And the Bible tells us this, casting your burdens upon him, for he careth for you. Understand that the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. Uh, whatever you're going through, whatever the trial may be, whatever the situation is, uh, Satan will want you to believe that God has left you, and God doesn't love you, and God doesn't care for you, and, and you deserve what you got. But let me tell you, Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for you. Can you say this with me? Jesus cares for me. Can you say that? Jesus cares for me. Jesus cares for us. And he is the one who cherishes. He cherishes you. And he clothes you. And he provides for you. And he's with you. And he will oversee you. And he will protect you. And he, he will uh, set a hedge of protection around about you. And that is the Lord's promise to everyone. To every believer. So we need to understand that the Lord not only provides, but he also cares. He cares for us. He's looking after us. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 121. And uh, you might want to note this psalm and maybe spend some time this afternoon meditating on it. Psalm 121. Psalm 121. I don't know if the guys can get it up on the screen for us, but uh, from verse 1. The Bible says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't uh, take time off to go to sleep? Aren't you glad that he doesn't slumber? Aren't you glad that he doesn't take a break? You know, it's, uh, it's like, you know, that's it. I've done my eight-hour shift or my 12-hour shift now. It's, time for, it's, you know, it's my personal time now. Uh, he does not slumber. He does not sleep. Uh, he looks over you, and behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. What a wonderful God we have. The Lord cherishes his church. He oversees it. He protects it. Uh, he does not slumber or sleep. He, he will not let evil prevail over it. Uh, his power, by his power, he protects it. And he's protecting you. Never let Satan discourage you on this fact. Never let Satan uh, make you think that God is far from you. No, he's ever near. And he careth for you. Jesus cherishes his church. Lastly, this morning, we find that, that there is a completion and unification in Christ. We go back to Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible tells us this, 
that he nourishes and he cherishes it, even the Lord the church, for we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, let's think about this. In the picture of marriage, the man, the, 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 the man would leave his mother and father, and the woman would leave her mother and father, and the two would come together, and they'd be, be joined as one. That's what marriage is, right? The leaving and the cleaving. Okay? You leave your parents' home, and you come together. Now, sometimes this is dysfunctional because people don't know how to leave. They get married, but they still want to be in their parents' homes. Or they still want to be, oh, I have to I go ask my daddy what he says, and, and I have to get counsel. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting advice, but now you're not under the rule of your parents' household. You, have, you must leave, and now together you cleave. So there's a leaving. There's a leaving. Now, how did Jesus do that? He left the Father's home. He took on the form of flesh, like you and me. He became incarnate. Let me tell you, Jesus today, he is in a glorified body to which we will have one day when we go to heaven and be with him. Jesus left the Father's house in order that he will be joined to his bride, the church. He left heaven, took on the form of human mankind, and now he's on the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me. And he's doing and accomplishing his work in his church. He left and has made a commitment to join himself to his bride. Let me ask you this question. Has his bride made the same commitment? Has, have you, being part of the church, part of that bride to which we are betrothed or espoused to Christ, the wedding is going to be in heaven one day, but you today, have you in your own mind understood the fact that there is a marriage relationship one day with Jesus? Have you left the rudiments of this world? Have you left your past life? Have you left the thinking and, and the, the, the things you, that you enjoyed back in your old life? Listen, you can't bring the two together. And there is no husband, there is no groom or bride at the marriage altar when they're giving their covenants. They'll say to you, yes, I want to marry you, but you know, at the same time, uh, I would like to stay connected with Susie. I'd like to stay connected with Joanne. Uh, I, you know, th they were wonderful ladies that I had in my life, and, and I would like to continue with them. And there is no woman at the marriage altar will accept a covenant like that from a man. And there's no way that a man is going to accept a marriage covenant from the woman and say, you know, you're a great guy, I love you, I'm going to marry you, but I, I still like Johnny, and I still like Bill, and, and I still want to hang out with them, and, and I want to live with... There's no way you will not accept it at the marriage altar when you give those kind of covenants. Now, let me ask you, how do you think, how do you think as being the church, being the bride of Christ, you can continue living in the world enjoying the pleasures of the world, enjoying the rudiments and ordinances of the world, but you say, Jesus, I love you, and I'm ready to get myself ready to be your bride. I don't know how that works. I don't know how you've reasoned that out in your minds. I don't know how that would work. If we understand that we are his flesh and we are his body, then there must be something in our covenant relationship with him that needs to change. If I am that Christian who has called upon the Lord to save me, I cannot continue living the way the world lives. I cannot give my affections and give my desires of the pleasures of this world. Those things need to be changed, don't you think? If there's going to be, if we, if we, expect, if we expect him to nourish and to cherish the bride, then there needs to be an act on the bride's part that it cleaves to him, right? You're not going to expect a man that he will love and cherish his wife if she at the marriage altar said to him, listen, buddy, I love you, but I love all these other people at the same time. He's not going to provide her with nourishment and cherishing when she's rejected him and said to him, there are other people who have more priority than you. Listen, the church 
is of the Lord. It's not because I formed it, not because any great man formed it, but Christ instituted it. And she will be his glorious bride. Are you ready? Are you ready to give that commitment? Are you willing to dedicate your life to Christ and say, Lord, I'm going to put away my sinful life, my old life, and I just want to be everything you want me to be? Lord, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love your church. I'm going to be there. I want you to do that work in me. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready to do that? See, the reason why the church today is ineffective or hobbles along is because Christians have not made that choice yet. I know it's hard to hear, but I'm going to say that again. The reason why church becomes ineffective and hobbles along in this world is because Christians have not made that link and commitment yet to say, I belong to Jesus, I am his bride. And I have to leave, I have to leave what I had before and cleave to him. It's a picture of marriage. The Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. The Lord sanctifies the church and, and cleanses it with the washing of water of the word. And thirdly, he cherishes and he, he cherishes and he nourishes the church. Jesus sacrificed. Jesus sustains now. He sustains his church. That's why, when I said the statement at the beginning, the success of a church in this world is its ultimate dependency upon Jesus. It's not because you can work great ordinances, great religious work. No, it's because we are dependent on him who nourishes the church and he cherishes the church. What will you do today? What will be your decision today? How will you view church today? What will be your connection in church today? What will be your commitment to church today? Jesus loved the church. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hey, thank God for our salvation, amen? Thank God that we're going to heaven, amen? But thank God that he's given us church where we could be together. And where two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's rip our heads and close our eyes. I want to ask you this question. Anybody here who says, you know what, Pastor, I, I would really like to know how I, can, how I could be saved, how I could put my trust in Jesus Christ, how I could have my sins forgiven today. And I heard you say, Pastor, that Jesus is the only one who can forgive sin. And truly today, I want to be forgiven. Is there anybody here who would say, Pastor, would you show me how I could be saved? Just slip your hand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out, but I want to take time after the service to spend time with you, show you through the word of God how you could be saved. Is there anybody here this morning? Just slip your hand up quietly. I'll see it. Nobody's looking around. Pastor, I want to be saved. Anybody here? Okay, uh, if you're a Christian here today, has, has the Holy Spirit challenged you this morning about your connection and commitment to a church? church meeting like this. I'm not asking you about your obligations and, and doing the things, oh, I've done, my, I've done my part for God this Sunday morning, now the rest of this day and the rest of this week is mine. You're going to allow the Lord to, to nourish you and grow you. Would you allow the Spirit of God to work in your life? Would you allow the Word of God to enrich you and change your thinking? Would you be committed to pray to the man, for, the, for the man of God in your midst that he will teach you sound doctrine? That's what we need. We need sound doctrine. I'm going to give you a few moments to pray. And uh, as the music plays, I, um, I will then conclude with a final, with, with a final prayer.
Father, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've spoken to us. We pray, Lord, that we will truly meditate upon your word and may it change us. Realize the importance of church that you've instituted. Lord, what a privilege you've allowed us to be part of. Help us to please you, to love you. Thank you, Lord, that you care for us. Thank you that you are the one who nourishes the body. Thank you that you are the one who cares for the body. And Lord, we cast ourselves upon you. We desperately need you, Lord. In this evil world today, we, we want to draw nigh to you. We want to be more like Christ. We want you to have your good pleasure in us. We love you. Pray that you continue a good work in the lives of your children today if there be still someone who's wrestling with their assurance of salvation or wrestling with their salvation, whether they're going to heaven or how they can have their sins forgiven, Lord, would you give them courage today? The Holy Spirit encourage their heart that they will seek you, they will call upon you, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray.